the key thing. If you want more of happiness or love, give more happiness and love. So happiness is the thing. One of the reasons, why do I study? Why do I teach happiness at Harvard? It's fun. Awesome. It's, I mean, it's a cool gig. Why do I write about it in the Atlantic? It's the best. The reason is because I want more happiness. How do I get more happiness? I teach it. Mm. That's how you do it. And it's actually, there's a whole brain process to this. This is really important. If you want to understand something in your, in your, in your, the, the, big meaty part of your brain. That's the most human part called the prefrontal cortex, the big part of mm -hmm. your brain behind your forehead. Y you actually have to think about what you're doing and explain it to other people. Mm -hmm. Then you will own it forever. I kept, you know, I kept, I'd read about happiness and I'm really interested in happiness, but I wasn't happy until I taught it. <laughs> it's the secret. And that made the biggest difference. Big difference. Yeah. Wow. That's it. All right, the giveaway today, again, it's Map Symmetry because we're in launch week, okay? It's a brand new Maps program, a lot of demand, a lot of people excited, but you can win Map Symmetry for free. You just got to do this. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel. Turn on notifications. If we like your comment, we'll notify you and you'll get free access to Map Symmetry. Now, everyone else, we're launching this brand new program, so it is on sale. Instead of being $177, it's only $97, plus we throw in two eBooks that I wrote. The first one is the muscle building secrets of isometrics. The second one is reverse dieting 101. So you get those eBooks for free for getting map symmetry for the low price of $97. Of course, everything comes with a 30 day money back guarantee. One more thing, this launch ends the 17th. After that, everything goes up to retail price. So if you're interested, go to mapsymmetry.com and then use the code SYM50 for the discount and the giveaways. All right, here comes the show. Arthur. Hey. Always great yeah. to have you on. I'm in person. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Welcome to our it. studio. Literally I'm one so of my happy. favorite people in the world. Um, now, I, I want you to real quick kind of explain what a social scientist is and, and what that's about. Because as we get into this, I want people to understand kind of your background a little bit and how you know the stuff you do. Social science, well, it's a broad category of everything from psychology to economics. And what it studies is, studies is human behavior. The idea of what people do and trying to understand it using scientific, mostly statistical tools and, and, and experiments on human subjects. So it's the same, more or less the same toolkit as if you were a natural scientist, but you're studying the humans, okay. which is hard because, you know, the, the, the natural world is highly complicated. Humans are complex, meaning that you kind of know what they want, but you don't know what they're going to do. Oh, so it's a yeah. tricky business for sure. But that's, but my, my laboratory is you know, the airplane, it's conversations, it's, you know, human interactions. I and mean, that's, that's what I'm most interested in because love and happiness, that's what we all want. Yeah. You're, you're my favorite happiness expert for sure. Uh, so uh, when you study this, then can you somewhat accurately predict what, how humans are going to feel or what makes them feel particular ways? Or are we so complex that it's almost impossible? Well, you have to have a lot of humility. And, and one of the things that we don't have very much in academia is humility, which is a big problem. And so we, you don't get beyond what your data will allow you to predict or, or even explain. But the truth is we know a lot more than we used to because there's been such an explosion in the, the intersection of neuroscience and statistical methods of studying social behavior that we know a lot more than we did in the past. So, for example, we, even 50 years ago, people would say, you can't study happiness. It's a feeling. Well, it's not a feeling. Happiness is not a feeling any more than your Thanksgiving dinner is the smell of the turkey, mm. which is just evidence that there's something good going on in the kitchen. The Thanksgiving dinner is actually protein, carbohydrates, and fat. Or if you're not, if you're a little bit more sentimental, it's, you know, the turkey and the stuffing and the vegetables and <laughs> that you're going to eat with a bunch of people that you love. And so you can actually study happiness m much more like, you know, we would study nutrition if we've been in the past and which is a sign you can take a scientific approach to it, but you don't want to get beyond the range of your headlights. You don't want to start saying things are absolutely settled as if it were the laws of gravity. So why, that's a lot we don't know. Why does academia lack humility? Academia lacks humility because we have a tendency to, th the, to, to puff up our own egos and to say, since I know all this stuff, I must know everything. And I'm talking to people who know less and they're expecting me to know the answers. And nobody wants to go to a big expert in any field and have them go, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, but the truth is that you guys do this too, because you're experts. I mean, this is the most popular podcast in fitness and culture and health in the world right now. And so anybody who is listening to this, they're going to be like, well, these guys, they know everything about fitness, but there's lots of stuff you don't know about fitness. True. Saying you don't know is a hard thing for human beings to do. This mm -hmm. is, you know, lesson one of social science. People don't like to say, I don't know. Yeah. You know, what's yeah. interesting about yeah. that as trainers, uh, it took me a couple of years to realize that if I said, I don't know, I actually got more respect for my clients yeah. and they were more likely to um, take my advice when I did know. 
So, and that's the irony. At first I was afraid of saying, I don't know. And then afterwards I was like, I was happy to say it. And because yeah. people, it was easy real. for me. Yeah. I really didn't know. So it was, right. <laughs> no, it's true. But the people, what who the don't, hell am I doing here? <laughs> people don't want to display what looks like weakness. Right. And this is a real problem that even as a human foible is that we don't want to display any sort of weakness, but it's absolutely true. You get more credibility when you explain that you don't know. So when I'm lecturing my students, I mean, I have this, you know, big sections of MBA students at the Harvard business school, taking this class on the science of happiness. And, you know, I've been studying this stuff for decades and they're taking it for the first time and they're super into it. I mean, they're just like, and they're great. They're smart. They're applied. They're interested. And they'll be firing these questions at me and I'll be talking at the posterior cingulate cortex. I'll be talking about different parts of the brain, all this technical stuff. I'll be talking about the, the neuromodulators of, and how it deals with emotion in the limbic system and yada, yada, yada. And so they think I know absolutely everything. And they'll ask me a question that's relatively basic. Like, why do I love my dog so much? I'll be like, huh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, and I, I don't, I, I'll, I'll that. get back to you, yeah. <laughs> but they actually have respect more when the, somebody who's mastered the field, or at least arguably has more mastery over the field than they do says, I don't know, because we don't know everything because we can't know everything is the bottom mm. line. Mm. So as somebody that studies human behavior, the last couple of years must've been very interesting for you because it's been somewhat unprecedented in in my lifetime for sure i've never experienced anything like that before right and the just the pressures and the changes and the stresses what are the big things that stood out to you or is there anything that you learned or saw that was surprising well it was a happiness experiment it was a massive happiness experiment now it's interesting though that people are always caught off guard every 10 years there's a big thing like that that mm. happens to society and it's uninvited so it's unwelcome <clears throat> which is worth keeping in mind i mean you can have a change and if you invite it even if it's really hard, like, you know, you quit your job and you go through a period of, of relative insecurity. If it's at your, vol if of your volition, then, then it's not terrible. But sure. if it's imposed upon you, then you really hate it because we don't like to lose control. And this is what happens about every 10 years. And people forget that, that every 10 years is something as big as the coronavirus epidemic that happens to us as a, a systemically. So 10 years before this big crisis was the financial crisis That's when true. maybe the ATM machines were going to stop working. That's the level of, of dislocation that we had. You know, people graduated from college and not getting any work for two years. Crazy. 10 years before that, it was 9-11. Mm -hmm. 10 years before that, it was the end of the Soviet Union, the end of the Cold War. Every 10 years, there's something huge that, that fundamentally changes the way that we live and the way that we see the world. 10 years from now, it's going to be something else. And we're going to be like, ah, I was paying attention to the next virus and financial meltdown, and it was <laughs> fill in the blank. The problem is we as a society need to be better at involuntary change than we actually are. However, every time this happens, it's a big experiment in the changes in human happiness. And you see how behavior changes and you see how mood changes and how people deal with it in different ways. So for me as a social scientist, it's been the most interesting thing. And by the way, I'm going through it like everybody else. Mm -hmm. And you and I, we text a lot, mm -hmm. you know, and we talk to each other a lot about, you know, and I'm like, so, you know, you gave me advice, mm -hmm. quite frankly. I mean, you know, my home gym, for example, that was a huge, huge part of my, my own personal happiness. And so I wound up doing research on why it is that, for example, resistance training is critically important in times of relative inactivity for inducing the neuromodulators in the brain that will help you to deal with problems of loneliness and seclusion and isolation, mm. for example. So e even those types of things were a learning experience for me. Would you say that Fear or control are the biggest deterrents towards your pursuit of happiness. So fear is a huge one. And the reason for this is that fear is the opposite of love. Love is the secret of happiness. As a matter of fact, there's a, at Harvard, we have a study called the Harvard Study of Adult Development, which is an 84-year longitudinal study of the same people starting in the late 1930s. It was Harvard graduates, um, among them JFK, Ben Bradley, the publisher of the Washington Post, mm. these pr pretty famous guys. And they mixed it with people who had not gone to Harvard because it's not exactly diverse. You know, all white up cl upper class <laughs> guys went to Harvard. But then people who didn't go to college and then their spouses and their descendants. So it's become demographically very diverse. And we looked at what they did over the course of their lives. And there's a bunch of things. You can find seven big patterns for things that they did voluntarily that led them to being happy and well when they got older, when they were old. But the number one by far, and they sum up the whole study, is that happiness is love full stop. So therefore, you want to know not just to have more love in your life, but what is the, the greatest antagonistic force in the universe against love? And the answer is it's cognitive opposite, which is fear. People often think that hatred is the opposite of love. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. Hatred is downstream from fear. Mm -hmm. Anytime somebody's expressing hatred, it's because they're fearful. 
always. Fear is uh, is actually takes up more brain tissue to process than any other basic emotion. Interesting. Yeah. I didn't yeah. know that. And the reason is because it keeps you alive. Yeah. So this yeah. is that the same thing. Without fear, sense. you're dead. You're dead hundreds of thousands of years ago. You're like, ah, oh, it's a beautiful day. I found some berries on a bush. <laughs> and I think life is really great. And there's a saber-toothed tiger sneaking up behind you. A twig snaps. And you're like, it's just a twig. Yeah. And you're his lunch. So how do we balance those two then? If if it obviously serves us yes. for survival for reasons, sure. but then it also can cripple us because it's the opposite of love. How do you... Well, you need fear to be sure, but you need to actually have it not be maladapted, particularly to modern circumstances. The way that fear is supposed to be processed in the human brain is that it's episodic and intense. The problem that we have in modern society is it's not episodic, it's chronic and mild. True. And the way this works, it, when, when fear is activated, for example, you're walking across, we're in San Jose, and you're walking across the street, minding your own business, beautiful day, it's always a beautiful day here. Somebody runs a red light and is, a car is coming straight toward you. That's processed by the visual cortex of your brain without you being conscious of it. It's imprinted into the amygdala which is part of the limbic system of your brain. This is a million years old, this part of the brain, which sends a signal through your hypothalamus to your pituitary glands in your brain, sends a signal to your adrenal glands, which sit right above your kidneys, and they pop out cortisol, epinephrine, and norepinephrine. This happens in 74 milliseconds. Mm -hmm. It's like three seconds later that you jump out of the that you've already jumped out of the way and your your heart is pounding and you're sweating. You've already flipped off the driver before you know even what's going on. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. That's why fear is so important. And you need that, but it has to be episodic and intense. The way that we use it now is you, you know, open up social media and your chest starts to tighten yeah. up and, you know, somebody's going to trash me and I'm going to get canceled or, you know, whatever it is that people are really freaked out about. That's just a little drip of stress hormones, drip, 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 mm -hmm. drip, drip. And that's bad. So how do you deal with that? That's modern life. And the, the way that you deal with that is that you don't just, you, you can, you know, mindfulness meditation and everybody should listen to mind pump and learn and get in really good shape. I mean, there's all kinds of things that we should do, but fundamentally the way for you to deal with your fear is more love. You go to the cognitive opposite. This is the key thing. Don't deal with it automatically. I mean, you should deal with it directly as well, but go to its opposite and surround the fear with love. You need more love in your life. You need more romantic love. You need more family love. You need more real friendships. Deal friendships are not the same. Hmm. And you need, so you need faith, you need love of the divine, you need love of your friends, you need love of your family, and you need romantic love. So give me an, an actionable thing that I can do. So I open up my social media instantly at the, like you said, the closing of the chest, and I'm getting frustrated and fearful because of everything that I'm seeing. Uh, what's an actionable thing I can do? Obviously, shut it off. That's right. the first thing. But then I want to pursue love. What does that look like? Text Katrina, I love you. Ah, Seriously. Mm. No, you're right. Seriously. Because that, what that will do is that will actually stimulate Force your you brain. You're, I mean, you're, you've got four negative basic emotions that are automatic. They're fear, disgust, anger, and sadness. And three automatic positive emotions that happen to you automatically, which are joy, interest, and love. Those are the big three, and you need to stimulate love in particular. And the way that you do that is by expressing love, expressing true, authentic love. Talk about a challenge, though, for somebody, right, who's yeah. like stuck in the, well, the totally. fearful mindset and then to try and transition over to that, especially since I know that I get a follow-up question whenever I send that. She yeah. knows why to ask me, yeah, why did What's I say that? What are you yeah, thinking yeah. about? Right? Yeah. That's right. yeah. Yeah. Well, part of it is that you can have a, you can have a deal with her, that when I'm, when I'm feeling stressed, when I'm feeling, when there's trouble, I'm, I'm going to reach out to you and just tell you what's really important to me, which is that you're written in my heart. My love, you're written on my heart. Love that. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I feel like sometimes I take for granted that you have to purposefully place yourself in love and seek it and yeah. not just seek it, but give it yeah. almost like um, I, I just, it, I take for granted that it just happens. Like, oh yeah, love just happens. It's not something I have to actually work towards and seek out. But the way you talk about it is to make a conscious effort yeah. towards it. Give it. This is the key thing. If you want more of happiness or love, give more happiness and love. So happiness is the thing. One of the reasons, why do I study? Why do I teach happiness at Harvard? It's fun. Awesome. It's, I mean, it's a cool gig. Why do I write about it in the Atlantic? It's the best. The reason is because I want more happiness. How do I get more happiness? I teach it. Mm -hmm. That's how you do it. And it's actually, there's a whole brain process to this. This is really important. If you want to understand something in your, in your, in your, the, the, big meaty part of your brain that's the most human part called the prefrontal cortex, the big part of your mm -hmm. brain behind your forehead, y you actually have to think about what you're doing and explain it to other people. Mm -hmm. Then you will own it forever. I kept, you know, I kept, I'd read about happiness and I'm really interested in happiness, but I wasn't happy until I taught it. <laughs> it's the secret. And that made the biggest difference. Big difference. Yeah. Wow. That's it. Uh, why are we seeing, because we have, I mean, objectively speaking, life is, 
better in terms of uh, safety and dangers and right. food and material things and entertainment and all that stuff. Uh, but I keep reading statistics about um, people are more depressed and more anxious, especially right. kids, especially adolescents and teenagers. Do we do we have any ideas as to why kids are experiencing this more? I mean, I have two teenage kids, and right. I, I I think about this a lot. Yes, yeah, so Justin's question is fear. It's mm -hmm. fear. Fear is the problem. We're in a fear based polarity in our culture, and there's a lot of reasons for this. I mean, there's a lot of ex there. Part of it is that you know we tend to oscillate between fear and love as the as the mm -hmm. vehicular language of how we express ourselves, and we tend to be in. A, I mean, you look at politics today; it's all it's all fear. Yeah, it's like vote for me because the other guys are going to hurt you and come take your stuff, and I'll protect you. And <laughs> yeah. it doesn't matter if you're on the right or the left. This yeah. is this is the this is the language that we actually get from national leaders. But you also see it every place else. You know, women are afraid of men and men are afraid of women that we're afraid of actually expressing our politics. And, and look, the, the freest, most upwardly mobile country in the history of the world, and we're actually afraid to express our politics we're going to get canceled on Instagram. I mean, and this is a fear-based polarity that we have in our culture today, which is hugely problematic. We have, as parents, we overprotect our kids. Mm -hmm. um, on social media, we actually are exposed to the criticisms of complete strangers in mass numbers. And the result of this is this intense social fear that's filtered itself down to the way that we conduct ourselves. So you find that the people are about 30% less likely to say they're in love than they did in the 1980s when really? they were in their 20s. Yeah, yeah. So kids in their 20s today, kids, young people in their 20s today are 30 percentage point percentage points less likely to say they're in love than I was when I was in my That's 20s, massive. which was in the 1980s. It's unbelievable. Wow. You never see data like this. This is catastrophic. This is a cataclysm in human happiness. Mm. And so all of this, what we're talking about, the the depression, I mean, and, and again, you can look for more proximate technical causes like the uptake in social media, which is the junk food of social life. Yeah. It, yeah. You know, in the same it's way processed that- Processed food. Yeah, for, totally. I mean, it's like eating McDonald's every day. Mm -hmm. is, and part of it is because there's a, a neuropeptide in the brain called oxytocin that functions as a hormone. And it, it you get it from eye contact and touch. You don't get it from social media. So you binge on it in the same way that you'll binge on burgers and fries when you're hungry, get too many calories, but you're hungry again an hour later because mm -hmm. you haven't met your nutrient needs. Same thing is true for, for social media. And all of this leads to loneliness, leads to depression. And it's all in this brew of fear that we see as a society. Yeah. Today. when it, With social media, I mean, from a fitness perspective, the thing that I notice a lot with, with body image issues is they get worse because, and I'd love your input on this that you see all these perfect bodies and your brain just unconsciously compares you to these people mm -hmm. and you have this bias like, oh, everybody yeah. looks like that. When no, guys like me are comparing ourselves to you is right. the problem. Oh, you know? come on. Do you, <laughs> don't say that. I, got, I, I know how ripped you are. But <laughs> but, it, but it, it makes you, you without being conscious about it, you end up comparing yourself and you end up thinking, my God, everybody looks like this and I look you know normal or whatever. Right. And I feel like it does that with um, news, with you know, scary things. So you read on social media and that's what obviously gets popular. So as a kid, you're like, oh my God, everything sucks. There's all the scary stuff. I can't do anything about it. I, am I going, am I kind of heading down the right path? No, is that's that, right. Is okay. the, the, the comparison sets are too big for sure. And this is one of the problems with social media. Um, no, it's the, the 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 lack of approval from other people, the criticism from complete strangers for sure. But then there's the social comparison issue, mm. which is a completely different issue, but it's a really deleterious one not, nonetheless. Social comparison that, you know, the Teddy Roosevelt, the president of the United States, called social comparison the thief of joy. Yeah. He was kind of a good social scientist. Mm -hmm. um, he understood humans pretty well. He's one of my favorite presidents to read yeah, about, sure. by the way. Yeah, yeah, no, he's a really interesting guy. Yeah. He's a really interesting, and highly entertaining too. But he, and he called, and it really is the thief of joy. You know, when you compare yourself to other people, there's nothing good can come of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, we do that, that, the only way to do that is to surround yourself with people that you know in person and whom you admire. Mm. Then it's a really good thing to do because then you want to become more virtuous. You want to become more admirable. You want to actually take on people's good qualities. So one of the things that I've done actually pursuant to this research is I surround myself with people I admire like you. Mm. It's like, I, 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 I want to surround myself with people who have virtue, not, you know, somebody who's got just like better abs. That's, that's not virtue per se. It's, it's like good. It's fine. You know, it's just like having, having better abs, is like having more money. Although as you will point out, there's more people with a million dollars than have, have you know, <laughs> yeah. visible abs in America today, <laughs> which is a pretty interesting statistic, I have to say, because yeah, yeah. it wasn't that long ago when it was the reverse because we didn't, we had no money and no food. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Everybody had abs. <laughs> that's right. They got <laughs> abs. It's like talking, that's called being malnourished. Yeah. And <laughs> so, but, but that's the key thing is you surround yourself with people with whom you want to have your own comparisons because you want to elevate yourself morally in terms of virtue mm -hmm. but everything else is bad everything else is bad for your happiness
this. It's bad, bad for your health. It's bad for your social life. It creates fear. And at least into the cycle of problems that we're talking about. Yeah. You, you spoke about pro- overprotecting our kids. And yeah. that, that uh, resonates with me because I have that tendency. I, I have that tendency to want to just, right. you know, cover them up and make sure nothing ever happens. And uh, I want to ask you a personal question. I yeah. know one of your sons is a Marine. Right. And he's out there, I mean, in the front, in yeah. danger. How did you handle that personally with that? Because I'm, I'm sure part of you wanted to be like, no, don't put yourself in danger. Like, how did that how did that work out? Well, part of it is just n- is is knowing yourself. And so confronting this quite consciously. The problem with fear is when you don't know you're being motivated by fear. Okay. Then you'll act according to it. When, okay. you, when you make something conscious, you can manage it. So here's the deal. When something mm-hmm. is limbic, that part of your brain that acts automatically with your, your basic emotions, we talked about that a minute ago, it will manage you. If you actually become conscious of it, you can manage it Mm -hmm. because you're literally processing it in a different part of your brain. That's called metacognition. When you're afraid, you have to sit down and say to yourself, Sal is feeling fear. Why is Sal feeling fear right now? Mm -hmm. Oh, that. Huh. That's interesting. Sal always feels fear under those circumstances and you become you become the boss. <clears throat> you become the boss of your fear. So this is the same thing with almost anything. If you basically have this visceral kind of primeval caveman fear because something might hurt your might conceivably hurt your child, then you'll do often the wrong thing. Mm. You know the truth is you shouldn't overprotect your kids. It's bad for them. I mean, my parents didn't overprotect me on the contrary. You know I had this paper route when I was 11 years old yeah. in this working class neighborhood in like in Seattle where I grew up in this, in this lower middle class neighborhood in Seattle. It was the same neighborhood that Ted Bundy had been marauding for, right? <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> a few years earlier for sure, but there was this like craze in the 1970s about you serial know, killers. Serial right? killers, yeah. serial killers, right? And my mom is like it was 4:30 in the morning at this paper route. And my mom says, you know, do you think we should let Arthur be walking around at 4.30 in the morning in the neighborhood with, you know, vicious dogs and serial killers about delivering papers? And my dad, you know, he wanted to, he wanted to protect my interest because I always had like $20 bills hanging out of my pockets. And, 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 and so <laughs> I was a pretty entrepreneurial kid. And my dad, it's like he had a, uh, he had a PhD in biostatistics. And so he tried this scientific approach on my mom. He says, well, you know, I've been studying the data. And uh, I don't think Arthur fits the core demographic profile of a serial killer. <laughs> <laughs> they don't want to kill him. Huh? <laughs> He's <laughs> fine. Yeah. They won't be going uh, after she's him. She's like, uh, and, and she says, what? She doesn't understand the things he's saying. And finally, he says he, he, he resorts to pure you know, emotion. He says, well, even the perverts have to sleep sometime. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. It's, Logic. It was very different even when, I, when we were kids. I mean, I, I would go, I'd tell my mom, I'm, I'm going to go hang out with my friends or go, and at what time are you going to be back? And then that was it. I was gone. I was yeah, I disappeared totally, into the ether. Totally. And yet we are different with our kids. Totally. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't have let my daughter, my baby, my perfect princess, you know, at 11, go walking around, go to the mall by yourself. Even though crime is lower, the right. world is safer. But we have to be very careful about those impulses because there, our limbic system is playing us like a violin. And we're mm. managing, it's managing us and we're managing our parenthood wrong under those circumstances. And it's bad for our kids. What are the consequences of that as parents? They get more fear. Mm-hmm. They get more, our kids become fearful the because the love. parents say, you're exactly right. You're, you're motivating them to behave in, in a way that's not consistent with the love that you want to motivate them as people so they can be happy and they can lift other people up. And the reason is because they take their cues from you. It's like the world's a scary place because my dad's scared. I mean, my mm-hmm. dad's scared. Didn't you tell me one time that you're like, when you were a kid, you thought that your dad could lift the house? Yes. Yeah. Yes. You told me that one yeah, time, right? And that your dad is the, this is one of the really interesting things. The reason that, that the biggest predictor of going to church is seeing your dad on his knees because mm-hmm. the strongest person in your life is on his knees for no man, but in front of God. Mm-hmm. That's the reason people are like, yeah, that's why I'm going to church. Cause even my dad was on his knees for that. Right. But if you're, but then now think of the dark side of that. That's true. If the only time you see your dad afraid is because you might walk to the mall, then the walking to the mall is a scary, dangerous thing. Mm. Wow. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, speaking of my dad, you know, your, your book, uh, resonated with me because I, my dad retired uh, a bit early uh, because he's arthritis up and down his spine. I and mean, he's been working hard labor since he was nine years old. And I, he went through like a two year like depression period. Like I remember he, he, he stopped working and that's all he did for most of his life. Right. And after that, he was like, and I remember my mom telling me, she's like, you got to get your dad out of the house because yeah. he's mopped the floor five times and he's <laughs> he's already rebuilt the backyard and he's, he's, he's the whole backyard. He's driving her like, crazy. Yeah, because he did like a million, pro- he didn't know what to do. And for like a couple of years, it was 
really tough for him. So I, I'd like to to go into your book a little bit, yeah. uh, strength to strength, and I'd like to start with w- the impetus. What motivated you to write this book? Because there's this great story of yeah. of kind of what got you to go down this path. Yeah. So when I was about 50 years old, um, I realized that I needed to make some changes. I mean, my life was good. I'm I'm a I'm a very lucky guy. I was the CEO of a think tank in Washington D.C. So for you know people who listen to Mind Pump who have a, a life and don't know what a think tank is, uh, which is a normal thing to not know. Uh, <laughs> a think tank is a research institution, like a university without students. And so I, it's a big research nonprofit in, in, in Washington, D.C., dedicated to helping politicians and policymakers make better decisions. And in our case, it was about how they could use the free enterprise system to lift people out of poverty, how to get a better national security system would protect America and America's interests, et cetera. And I had like 300 and some employees and I was raising $50 million a year. I was given 175 speeches. I was traveling around all the time. I was the king of the mambo, but I knew I couldn't keep it up and I wasn't happy. I wasn't happy. I mean, I had looked back, I'd found this bucket list. That I, this is the stupidest idea, the bucket list, so dumb. <laughs> and when I was, because all it does is it lowers your satisfaction because every year you look at the things you haven't done, you feel like a loser. <laughs> and it's like, that can motivate me. I don't know. Anyway, so I'm 50. I'm looking at my bucket list when I was 40. I'd done everything on the bucket list and I wasn't happy. Oh, no. I'm like, huh. So I'm like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And one night I'm sitting on an airplane from, from here, from California to DC. And it was like 11 o'clock at night. And I hear this couple talking behind me on the airplane. And, and <clears throat> I can tell they're old by the sound of their voices. I tell it's a man and a woman. I'm assuming they're married. And the guy is confessing, the man is confessing to the woman that he might as well be dead. And she's trying to console him. Oh, it's not true that nobody remembers you. And he's like, oh, I'm a has-been. I'm washed up. Nobody even take my calls anymore. And I'm thinking it's like a, it's like that Nicholson movie about Schmidt, you know, mm-hmm. where he's, <clears throat> he gets retired and gets a watch and they're throwing all his files away. And he's, <laughs> And it's it, in this old joke, you know, that you go from who's who to who's he in like a month. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm thinking it's probably somebody who's kind of disappointed and you kind of a, he wanted to do a lot, but never lived up to his own standards or capabilities or promise or whatever. And, and at the end of the flight, the flight, the lights go on and everybody stands up and I turn around. It's one of the most famous men in the world. Hmm. This is one of the most famous, successful men in the world who had, for decades ago had these big achievements, like not controversial. He's a hero. And, you know, as we were leaving the plane, the, the pilot said, you know, recognizes him because everybody would, said, sir, you've been my hero since I was a little boy. And at that point, he's beaming with hmm. pride. But I heard him. I heard his, I heard what was the dialogue going inside his head. Nobody hears this because inside I'm thought. What am I going to do? I mean, I'm like, I'm not going to be that guy. I'm not a hero. I'm not famous. I mean, it's, but, but, but what am I going to be saying to my long suffering wife, Esther at 85? I'm going to be like, I might as well be dead. Nobody remembers me. Nothing's good anymore. Or can I make some changes? What can I do for my happiness 401k plan? What can I do? What are the investments that I can make? Because I'm on the wrong track. I was lonely. I was working really super hard. I was not becoming more effective in my life. I was not cultivating the relationships that I need. I was not a very good husband um, because I was on the road all the time. And I'm thinking, you know, I, I, what, I mean, what's the deal? Who are the happy? What are the secrets of the happy people? And it turns out half the people get happier after 70 all the way to the end. And half the people get unhappier after 70 all the way to the end. And the people who get unhappier after 70 are the strivers. So the successful, the ones who have success early in life. Uh-huh. Wow. They're the ones who tend to be unhappier because they're disappointed with the contrast. See, look, if you don't do anything with your life, you won't know when it's over. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's the same. <laughs> if you do a lot, what goes up must come down. And so what do you do so that you can be, you guys, 40 years old, killing it, and at 70 still be happy? Mm-hmm. What can you do? And that's what this book is. It's your happiness 401k plan. It's my happiness. <laughs> it's my happiness 401k plan. It's me search, not research. So what, what are some other things that you found in common with those two groups that obviously at that point, a fork in the road, they go opposite directions. Obviously, it was not uh, directly connected to how much money or success they had. There was <clears> other <throat> things. Yeah. What are the common things between those two? It's groups? not money and success at all. It turns out. So, and and we all want money and success, but the question is, what do you do with the money and success? Mm-hmm. And if the money and success are an opportunity for you to invest in the things that really matter, your faith, your family life, your friendship, work that truly serves other people, then those things like money and power and pleasure and fame, then they're fine, but only as instrumental things to get to the stuff that really, really matters. And that's what happy people have in common. The second big point about the happiest people as they get older 
is that they recognize that their strengths change. And that's what the guy on the plane didn't figure out. He had this, you know, incredible life early on. He was, he was the king. And, and he, he wanted to keep that forever. This is the thing. You want to, you want to stay with us. They, they, there's this Hindu theory of life, the balance of life. And, you know, when you're in your zone for work and success, it's called grihastha. It's a word in Sanskrit for the house, you know, the, you're, you're, you know, you're the, the, the manager, the, the dad, you know, you've got all this worldly success. But around age 50, according to this Hindu philosophy, you've got to move to a, a, a period called vanaprastha, which means technically to retire into the forest, not literally. <laughs> but what it means is basically to start stepping back from these things, to start taking stock, to start investing in your relationships, to start teaching other people. This is entirely consistent with all of the best neuroscience research that shows that you get this curve of intelligence early on, and that's called fluid intelligence, which you get better and better and better at focusing, at being an innovator, at being an entrepreneur, but working indefatigably for these goals. And, and you're really good at that through your 20s and 30s, and the more you do, the better you get. But it peaks, and you start to decline in that, in that energy, in that focus in your 40s. And it's, it's, it's just falling like a rock in your 50s. Mm. But you get another curve behind it called your crystallized intelligence curve. That's increasing through your 40s and 50s and 60s and stays high in your 70s and 80s. That's your wisdom curve. Mm. That's your ability to teach. That's your ability to share knowledge, to, to build up other people, to create teams. And if you actually move from your you know, high horsepower curve to your wisdom curve, Th then the world is yours. But if you're trying to stay on that superstar curve, the first one through, it'll it'll, it'll be like you know chaining yourself to a you know a roller coaster that's going down and down and down and down and down and down and down. It doesn't come back up again. Wow. And that's so what's going on. Explain wisdom then. It, it, so there's obviously knowledge is a part of it, right. knowing information. Right. But what makes someone? What's the difference between someone who knows stuff and someone who's wise? Wisdom is knowing how to use what you know. Okay. So, so knowledge is being able to answer questions. Wisdom is knowing which questions are worth asking and answering. Mm. It's judgment is what it comes down to. It also has a whole lot of generosity in it. Wisdom to be wise, to have this crystallized intelligence is to say, here's the knowledge that's important. Here's how to use it. And here's how I can serve other people with it is the key thing. And you become other focused in a way that's deeply satisfying. That second intelligence curve, that crystallized intelligence curve, you can write it all the way in your life and get happier and happier and happier. And that's what the happiest people have. Wow. When do you know you achieve this crystallized intelligence? Is this all part of that whole 10,000 uh, kind of a, a journey where you're getting an accumulation of hours and um, you've been able to now see and predict patterns as, as they come? Yeah. What you find is that it gets a little bit harder to focus single-mindedly on a particular task in your 40s, but it gets easier for you to rec to do the pattern recognition. Mm, and it gets easier for, yeah, it gets easier and easier. What you guys are gonna find as this decade progresses, cause you're in your, I'm 15 years older than you guys. Mm -hmm. And as this decade progresses, what you're gonna see naturally because of the structure of your brain is that it's gonna get easier and easier for you to explain highly complex concepts in, in this show. In this or whatever the show becomes, because it's it's a morphing thing. It's mm -hmm. this is a communication vehicle. It's not a podcast. Mm -hmm. It's not a YouTube show. It's right. a way that and you're going to find that you're more and more and more professors, that you guys are teachers more and more. You're the whole thing is going to go from you know how you saw at the very beginning to build a company to actually sharing knowledge, and 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 you'll get better and better at it. Is the bottom line. Now there's a problem that we have in our culture which that valorizes youth. Yes. Right. And totally. especially we're sitting here in Silicon Valley. Yeah. And, you know, the problem is that this is uh, the industries, tech industry, for example, has revolutionized our country, revolutionized our world. And yet it's not very trusted or respected. And the reason is because it's all fluid intelligence, no crystallized intelligence. Yes. You know, we don't have, you need more 70 year olds in tech companies is the bottom line. They're going to made every mistake in the book. And they're going to mm -hmm. say, you guys, we're making a, we're making a product that hurts people. You guys, these are anti-competitive practices. Yeah, knuckleheads don't do bro culture. It's exploitative and it's and it's mm -hmm. undignified, and it's going to get us into a whole lot of trouble. I mean, older people know these things, so they have this mm -hmm. wisdom that they have. But when it's all kids, you got a problem. Yeah, you know it's interesting you're talking about fluid and going to crystalline. You know, Justin uh, was a very competitive football player in high mm -hmm. school, college. Um, talks about it. Uh, you know, I hear him talking. Very about happy it, yeah. when he talks about it. Brings him a lot of joy. Mm -hmm. Just started coaching high school football team. Mm -hmm. Obviously, very busy guy, and I've all of us have recognized the spark and the happiness that he, that's coming. And it's, it's exactly what you're talking about. He's mm -hmm. teaching 
what he used to do, and it's really cool to from see. From player to coach. From yeah. player to coach. It's a total Something. evolution, right? Yeah. And you sort of yeah. see that next chapter of how you can apply that knowledge and then yeah. see it see it foster right in front of and you. And 10 years ago, you wouldn't have been as good. Right. And the reason is not because you didn't have the experience. You knew just as much about football 10 years ago as you know today. But for some reason, it's easier to explain now. And the reason is because you've got crystallized intelligence because of the changing structure of your brain. Yeah. Mm. Wow. And, and now you you said something that's very interesting about us valuing youth so much yeah. and, and maybe not so much uh, wisdom and, you know, as people get older, uh, but other cultures seem to, uh, a lot of older cultures seem to value yeah. uh, wisdom and the elderly, for example, and you're very well traveled. Do you, w what lessons can we learn from some of these other cultures in terms of how we value wisdom? We see this, particularly in India and China, for example, there's a lot more respect that's given to older people and a lot more deference. And it's not just because it's the right thing to do. It's because it's smart. And so the way that we could adopt this is that you should have a 70 year old in every C-suite. You, you should, even if they don't quite understand, they don't have the hustle culture and the, and the, the acumen for the tech, you need more old people. You need more old people around is the bottom line. Mm -hmm. And you know, because the, the thing is 70 is the new 50. It's amazing, you know, that it, I feel like I'm 27. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason is because you trained me. Yeah. <laughs> right. The success of Mind Pump is because of Doug, for, for that exact reason right there. <laughs> he's our old guy that he's we keep around guy. just for that. <laughs> but he's still, he's still, 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 still younger than me. <laughs> yeah, maybe a year. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it's really important. I mean, it's really important that we actually the learn that that's the sort of the technical lesson of these Eastern cultures. But there's a moral lesson to it, too. Look, life is not that interesting when you don't have any diversity. Mm -hmm. You know, when everybody's the same, when we're all like clones, it's so boring, right? <clears throat> and we know that enough to know that it's important for men and women to work together, for people of different races and different backgrounds, different mm -hmm. cultures. That's all interesting. It just makes life better, right? Because different perspectives creates more quality. But the single most undervalued part of diversity is age diversity. You know, it's crazy. And we, and we set up our culture so you're all five-year-olds in kindergarten yep. and the cohort didn't chunk chunk going forward. I always thought this is so weird because we know this and we yet we still our school structure is still yeah. old. <laughs> and now we in instead of instead of having our elderly parents with us, we put them in a home. Mm. Which is a huge mistake because you can get I mean I understand it's a hassle having your grumpy dad living, <laughs> you know, in uh, in downstairs or whatever. <laughs> But there's so much to that. There's so much intergenerational wisdom and interest that we can actually get from that if we were to value it differently and understand that that could enrich us in big ways. You know what? You just literally put, you just literally explained what I miss most about personal training. I, I stopped training about a year into Mind Pump. Obviously, this was taken off and, you know, we had to put our, our time and energy into it. And I missed a lot about training people. But you, what I miss the most, and I'm really realizing this now, when you train people, you, I trained people who were 40s, 60s. I had yeah. clients in their 70s. I had clients that were in tech, others that were entrepreneur. I, just a wide variety of people, wide variety of ages. And you meet these people twice a week for years, you know? So you develop a relationship with them. And it was so profound, the yeah. amount of growth and stuff I learned. And now I'm starting to realize what it was. It was just I was surrounded by lots of very different people and different right. ages. Right. And you were getting a big mix of different kinds of intelligence. Yes. That was, and it went early on when I started training, when I started lifting and most of my late thirties and I, you know, I wasn't going to personal trainers. I was just trying to get in shape. And uh, I, what I figured out was I, I put together a little strategy where I thought to myself, well, look, let's see, what do I want to do with this? I'm not going to, I'm not going to be in a bodybuilding contest. I don't have the genes or the, 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 you know, the, it, the possibility of doing anything like that. I don't have the, I don't have the, I don't have the goods. <laughs> what do I want to do? I want to be healthy. I want to feel good. And I want to be able to do, I want to be doing this when I'm 80. So I started going to these old rusty iron gyms mm, where the best. old guys, hang yeah. out, right. The guys yeah. who are lifting and they're 75 years old and they're lifting, right. They're doing like deadlifts at 75. I mean, they're not afraid of that because awesome. they have they have good form. They know what they're doing. And I would go up to the old guys and the old guys will always give you advice. Yeah. You know, the old guys and say, how old are you? Like 76. I said, dang, I mean, you're deadlifting twice your weight. And, you know, and can you, can you give me a couple of pointers? And of course they'll give you a couple of pointers. So almost everything I learned in my late thirties, I learned from people in their sixties and seventies, mm -hmm. which was pure crystallized intelligence. Because when I was in my late, when I'm in my late seventies, I want to, I want to be going to the gym every day. Mm. Still speaking of wisdom, um, how important is it for your high achievers out there to consider having and applying a spiritual practice? It's hugely important to walk a transcendental path. And so it's so about half of your uh, happiness is genetic. 
Um, it comes, it's, I mean, it, your baseline happiness levels and your baseline mood levels actually comes from your genetics. If you have gloomy parents, you'll have a gloomy baseline is the bottom line or, oh, or, or vice versa. So your mother literally did make you unhappy. <laughs> <Bottom line. Wow>. <laughs> <laughs> and we're happy, you know, Thanks, it's yeah. like, like we say in my business, your results may vary, you know, <laughs> and, uh, um, about a quarter of your happiness is circumstantial, you know, things, good things going on, bad things going on in your life that are bringing you up and down. But those things never last. Everybody thinks that circumstances are everything. The thing that really matters the last quarter, which is your habits and the four big happiness habits. There's a lot of little things, you know, it's like what makes me happier resistance training or cardio. Those are little things and they, they're, they're not completely trivial, but the biggies are faith, family, friendship, and work, faith, family, friends, and work. And work has to only two characteristics. It has to be where you earn your success, which is why the free enterprise system is so incredibly valuable as an engine for letting us live up to our potential and serving other people, people who really, really need you. But the first one, faith, doesn't necessarily mean my Catholic faith, although I recommend it to everybody. I love it. But what you find in the data is walking a transcendental path, whether it's traditionally religious or spiritual or just philosophical, you need something that gives you a better metaphysical perspective on your life. And the reason for this is if you don't, it's just tedious and boring. You know, it's like left to your own devices, you will compulsively think my job, my money, my car, mm -hmm. my vacation, my money, me, me, my house, my friends, me, mm -hmm. me, me. Mm -hmm. And it's just tedious. It's like watching the same episode of the same sitcom every single day over and over and over again. And, you know, whether you're reading the Stoics or whether you're going to Roman Catholic mass or whether you're doing a, a Eastern meditation practice, something has got to daily give you relief from you is the bottom line. And so I, one of the things that I recommend to everybody is to start walking the, a spiritual path as soon as they possibly can. Mm. Mm -hmm. Is that more challenging? Now, I mean, you've been teaching for a long time. Do yeah. you see that become more, more challenging or, or, or younger people? Easier as you get older, it? right? It's harder it's when easier you're younger. As you get older, for sure. Yeah. It's, it's actually, that's actually, these days. It yeah. Seems. It's one of the things in the book that I write about is that people tend to after 40, that's when their interest in this starts to rise. Mm. And part of the reason is because frankly, their fluid intelligence is in decline. So their focus on their on the here and now, the focus on the tedious is in decline. What fluid intelligence will make you do is it'll allow you to focus intensely on something boring, <laughs> like being a lawyer, yeah. <laughs> right? And it's like it's like, I, it, it, and again, you know, I got I'm, I got no not to cast aspersions on lawyers. I'm glad that they're really really good lawyers. But I mean, it's like when you're 60, you're just not going to focus on the on the minutia of a legal brief in the same way that you will and can when you're 30. Your mm -hmm. brain is built for that. And so what happens after 40, people are like, man, I need some relief. I need something. I need to zoom out. I need perspective on this. This is one of the reasons they start getting much, much more interested in this. However, um, I find that my students every year are more interested in the metaphysical. Really? Yeah, yeah. Do you think hmm. is that is that do you think there's a correlation between that and like their their own the youth being more anxious? Yes. Oh, so yes, it has. It goes. It once again it ties right back to what we were talking about 15 minutes ago, which is fear. Is there and and the fear, which is antagonistic to love. Hmm. Remember that there are 30 percentage points less likely to be in love. They're less likely to be married. Less likely to cohabitate. They're having less sex. People in their 20s are having fundamentally less sex were than you were when you were in your 20s. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And and so what you and, and and again, you know, all, all of your your morals around these things notwithstanding, people just don't love each other as much. Mm -hmm. They have more fear, they have less love, and they're looking for some relief in their life. And so that's one of the reasons that they're they're asking spiritual questions. You know, uh, talking about fear again, I want to circle back cuz we kind of just briefly went through the whole COVID thing. And I just think that's still so top of mind for so many people, and I also think that we haven't seen all of the the consequences of what we all just right. went through. What are some of the things, one, that you learned uh, just kind of watching everything? And what are some things that maybe you predict is going to happen? And maybe that gives us some insight on how we can maybe combat it. Yeah, for sure. Well, it's interesting. Early on in the coronavirus epidemic, when people were locked down, they were intensely uncomfortable. People would even say, I can't sleep. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm irritable. I'm restless all the time. A lot of that has to do with this this hormone that we talked about a minute ago called oxytocin, which is produced by the human brain. It's the, it's the, the hormone of human bonding. This is what you get when you, when you, when you, I mean, we all have kids mm -hmm. and, and when you lay eyes, when eye contact with your baby for the first time, it's oh, like 4th yeah. of July oh, yeah. in your head. And oh, yeah. you know, the neurobiologists will evolutionary biologists say that's so you don't leave the baby on the bus or something. right? <laughs> right. <laughs> right? Yeah. But the truth is, I think it's a gift from God. Mm. I think that it is like, this is your baby. 
And this is, you know, for me as a Christian, this is like, the, this is the first time I truly understood my relationship with God was when I laid eyes on my first son. Mm. I said, oh, that's how God loves me. Yeah. Unconditionally, for no reason, no merit of my own. Mm -hmm. And it really put my life into perspective. Now, neurobiologically, that's oxytocin. And when you don't have it, you're not gonna be able to sleep right. You're gonna feel really uncomfortable. You're you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna crave highly glycemic carbohydrate, all the stuff that everybody was doing. So 85% of people, when they had all the time in the world to exercise, got out of shape. During the current fast too, it was the fastest rise in obesity. It's received. unbelievable. Yeah. Everybody got fat. Everybody was sitting around. Mm -hmm. People were eating hog and dos while watching Netflix and cocooning on the couch by themselves, yeah. feeling lonely and gross. Yeah, Tiger King. Yeah, yeah. Like everybody was watching Tiger King. Is that popular? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's like a, because of the pandemic. That's like that's a that's a it's a, a train wreck. That's, that's a neurological problem that people watch Tiger King. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that people like that, as a matter of fact. So so what we find is that that people were were getting into these really really bad patterns of loneliness of fear of isolation. And it, a lot of it had a had a, a neuroscientific basis to mm -hmm. it to be sure. But people were feeling this, and and happiness was just tanking all over the place. Now, the the interesting part about that is that <clears throat> people didn't people don't always take care of themselves. What happens is when you're lonely and you're fearful, that impairs your executive function. Your executive function is not your animal part of your brain, it's the human part of your brain, it's the front lobes of your brain that make you make good decisions notwithstanding your instincts. It's when you manage yourself as opposed to being managed mm -hmm. by your feelings. That's impaired when you're lonely. That's impaired when you're fearful. So what happens with the really problem, the big problem with the coronavirus epidemic is that people were involuntarily demobilized and, and they became fearful about getting sick or losing their jobs or having the economy melt down. And they were intensely lonely because of these crazy lockdowns and social distancing, which was just unbelievably deleterious for mental health. Mm -hmm. And the result of that was they became incapable of doing what they need to do. So you'll still see people who are really not in danger of getting sick, who are still walking around with masks because they're authentically fearful. Mm. The worst thing that we can possibly do who are not afraid is to make fun of them yeah. because they're actually afraid and their yeah. executive function is being impaired by the fear and the loneliness that they felt all the way through this virus. And that's what we actually see. So people are making a big set of bad decisions about their own lives at this point. Ordinarily, under normal circumstances, before the virus, about 9.5% of the population exhibits symptoms of clinical depression at any time, the American population, which is higher than most countries. Right now, it's 28%. Wow. Yeah. And that's still, even though we're technically past anything like full lockdown. I mean, we're I'm, my life is completely normal, except that and I fly every single week, except that I have a mask on the plane. Mm -hmm. That's the only meaningful difference in my life, even here in California, yeah. which was lockdown central. Yep. And so, but, but you find that people are, are reacting very, very poorly to this. There's a huge rise in mental illness. And what we need to do, we need to help each other. Mm -hmm. We need to love each other more. We need to show each other as much understanding and patience as we possibly can. And the worst thing that we can do is to attack each other. Those of us that are very skeptical of a lot of, uh, you know, the continuing, the, the most intrusive parts of these lockdown procedures that attacking people who disagree with us. We should not make this political and we should love each other more. Wow. Yeah, I feel like you just targeted me. Yeah. Yeah, me too. That. I'm talking to me. Yeah. I'm talking to me because it's very easy for me to like, come on. Yeah. Come on, get with it. Don't don't keep telling me to lock down. It's not right. But mm -hmm. the whole thing is these people are afraid and they they need my love. Meanwhile, it's like a meanwhile I feel like we're the most politically divided I've ever, totally. at least in my totally. lifetime. Totally. In my short 40 years, I have never felt like we were so divided as a country as we are That's right factually now. true. Oh, yeah, I've is. never seen extremism so popular. Sure. In just how polarized we are. Right. Like it just, that sounds like amazing. But I just, I, I wonder how we can actually start implementing that on a grander scale and, and get uh, leaders out there to to actually like promote that instead of um, you know just feeding to their base. I would question like, is extreme is extreme, is it really that popular or is it that's what we're being fed yeah. uh, through social media and things like that? So we yeah. think it yeah, is. Yeah, you precisely. Know? Absolutely. I, I precisely. Yeah. These are these are yeah these are it's something like ninety three percent of Americans hate how divided we become. <laughs> that means seven percent don't hate it. <laughs> and when you hate, somebody's profiting. 
This is yeah. the key thing. There's politicians, yep. there's media, it's the click machines, the people who are getting their jollies or their followers that actually come from this stuff. I mean, me, uh, hate is extremely profitable. And by the way, it has huge neurobiological implications to mm. it. You know, it's like, you don't get it. You don't stimulate dopamine in somebody's brain by going, you know, we should all just love each other. Yeah. You know, it's no, it's somebody, you should be afraid. You know, somebody's got your stuff. I'm going to get it back. You know, these mm -hmm. wily foreigners are going to come steal your stuff, whatever it happens to be, or whoever the targeted population happens to be, that that stimulates the brain chemistry of people, and it can lead to tons and tons of profits. So we need like a 70s all over again. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> it's funny. You know, it's funny because, the, yeah, right. The 70s was when the serial killers were running rampant. <laughs> well, you uh, had that too. And but. The, but also, it's the 70s were were tricky. I mean, they followed the seventies followed on a period of unbelievable political polarization. Yeah. And Ken Burns told me in 1968, yeah. 1969, there was something like 700 domestic political bombings. Yeah. You know, we don't have anything like that today. Uh -uh. Right. Yeah. And so it, for, for sure in our adult lifetime, this is the worst it's been, but arguably it was more violent back then. And that was followed on by a period in the seventies that was different in the eighties was a lot more positive. I mean, like or hate Reagan, my family thought he was terrible. Um, I was the odd man out because I thought he was kind of awesome because you know? <laughs> he loved me. I felt that he loved me mm. is that it kind of shifted the polarity in America from fear to love. And that's ultimately what we have to do. And each one of us, look, you guys are leaders. You have millions of followers, um, but you're also leaders in your family and you're leaders among your neighbors. And all of us have to be leaders with love all the wow. time and never yeah. falling prey to the culture of fear. Yeah. It sounds like fear yeah. and, and even loneliness, the combination is a, it becomes a positive uh, feedback loop. Yeah. It's, so it's like, uh, you know, I'm lonely, I'm scared. That makes me less likely to want to be around people. So I get even lonelier and more scared. Right. Okay. That's exactly right. And it's, it, it, all it is is a, all, all it is is a self-fulfilling prophecy of fear leads to fear. Um, and then you get more evidence of why that's the case. And then you got to break out of it. You got to clip the cycle someplace. And each one of us can clip the cycle in our own way. Everybody listening to us is a leader. They have that, you know, they, if, if you're anybody who's listening to mind pump, it's because you want to be better. You want to be a better person. You want to be um, more excellent. And anybody who wants to be more excellent is a leader in, in some part of their life. So show that leadership by showing more love is the mm -hmm. bottom line. And you will be part of the solution to the problem. Excellent. Arthur, you, uh, did you by chance read uh, Ray Dalio's latest book? Yeah. Oh, I really would love to hear your take on like what your thoughts are and uh, where are we at in the cycle right now and stuff. I know that I know you like economics too. So yeah. I'm just curious to what you think. It's hard. It's, you know, the, the th predictions on that are notoriously impossible. Right. And that's the reason for that is that we're, we're it's a random walk. You know, or, or as we say in, in the economics business, I'm actually an economist. It's a stochastic process, mm. you know, and if you were able to predict it, it would be it would be neutralized before it actually even happened. As you get some people with uh, Ray Dalio's got a ton of alpha and that just means, you know, beta is the normal to and fro of these markets and up and down and the random stuff. Alpha is your sensibility, your ability to predict a little bit better than anybody else. And you can actually calculate an alpha rating for hedge fund managers like Ray Dalio. Really? Yeah, yeah. And so yeah, that, that. there are alpha ratings for these different hedge fund managers. His is sky high because he's got this acute, tiny little bit. And all it takes is just a millimeter more alpha for you to be a billionaire you know, in these particular markets, right? Because you don't have to be right a tiny bit more than the other guys that's are profit. right. Yeah, that's right. And that's pure profit that accrues to you as the financial entrepreneur, to be sure. So, you know, what Ray Dalio says, you'd be foolish to actually think that that's not the case. Um, I think more about sort of the political economy of what's going on in our society today. And I think that there's good times coming. I okay. actually am. I'm, I'm not optimistic. I'm just hopeful. I think there's a lot that we can actually do. And what typically happens in American life with periods of polarization and the polarization is manifest in our economics. Yes. You know, people, when we're, when we're against each other, we're against each other. You know, we're not working together. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to, it's going to, you're going you're gonna to see it. Um, and I actually think that people are sick of it and they're going to, there's going to be a time where politicians who are notorious followers, leaders are actually followers. Mm. Like, what do people want? I don't, Oh yeah, that people want fear. Okay, I'll do fear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When they when they actually figure out when some politicians actually figure out that there's a, that people want more love, they people want more positivity, we're going to actually start seeing it Craving from it. from national leaders. I've heard you say um, that people often realize they're lonelier than they thought they were. Yeah. And there's a bit of an epidemic of loneliness. Yeah. So t talk about that a little. So bit. So that's the key thing about when your executive function is impaired. 
So you think, for example, Ugh, I feel crummy today. I think what I'll do is I'm, I'm just going to, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do self-care. Or as like we say in the university, they call it radical self-care. It's like, what the? <laughs> radical <laughs> radical <laughs> self-care. It's like, it sounds like indecent. I don't know. <laughs> and it sounds yeah. like, you shouldn't do that. You'll, you know, you'll go to hell. Anyway, the uh, <laughs> uh, self-care is, or they'll think about it as just kind of babying myself. Mm. And and what do you do when you baby yourself? You stay home. Yeah. You, you know, you get a cuddly blanket, you lie down on the couch, you eat the stuff that you want. You maybe have a bottle of wine. You watch, you binge something on Netflix. Exactly the wrong thing to do. Wow. When you're yeah. Exactly. And so what I teach mm. my students is called the opposite signal strategy, OSS. The opposite signal strategy is when you are feeling lonely, do the opposite of what you want to do. Mm. Wow. Is the key. And that means get out, get fresh air, <clears throat> do some exercise, call a friend, see people. These are the things that you should be doing when you actually feel like cocooning. Wow. And Almost that's always the case. And now, so this makes perfect sense why love is the opposite of, of fear because uh, you have to be vulnerable to do that. Like right. if I feel shitty, the last thing I want to do is call a friend and tell them, hey, what's up, man? Oh uh, yeah, I'm feeling yep. like shit right now. Really? I thought everything was going great. Uh, yeah. I don't know, you know. Yeah. So you have to be very vulnerable in mm -hmm. order to do that. For sure. You basically, you know, when you're, when you're feeling fearful, you bring fear to others. That's the wrong thing to do. When you're feeling fearful, you need more love. For you to get more love, you need to give more love. That's wow. an opposite signal strategy. When you're feeling crummy and afraid and lonely and sad, and you don't quite know why, sweetheart, I just want you to know I just love you so much. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. That's great. You shared a, a thought experiment that I, I don't want to mess up, so please take it from me as soon as I you, you just trigger it for you and you know what I'm talking about, where I think you said – you know, five, imagine five years from now and you are the happiest you could possibly be, yeah. you know, what are like your five things that you value and where are they at? And then, and then you ask, I guess, like, you know, how, are, how does that align with you now? Or yeah. what are you doing right now about yeah. that? Explain that. Like, yeah. yeah. So there's a, a bunch of experiments. <clears throat> this is on, it sounds technical, but it's actually really simple on what they call extrinsic versus intrinsic rewards. The extrinsic rewards are money, power, pleasure, and fame. Hmm. Those are the things that you get from the outside world. And that's what your brain, your animal brain says, that's what you want. And it'll make you permanently happy. You get like a boat. Man, I'll finally be happy. Mm -hmm. Like, no, you won't. <laughs> you won't. Like, <laughs> I got the data. You won't. Right? <laughs> and the same thing with, with and especially fame. You'd be fame a terrible easy. person to go shopping with. <laughs> I know, I know, I know, I know. Dude, I want this. Like, no, like, you're not dude, dude you don't want that. It's, like, it's just going to be that. It's, it's going to be a hassle. But, and fame is the only one of those things you can only ever be happy in spite of which is really interesting. Wow, so you're, interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your brain says, hmm. I and mean, you get all these, this, this rush of brain chemistry saying, if you actually get more followers, you get more clicks, it's going to give you actual happiness and it won't, what it's going to just complicate your life. Yes. And, and yes. so happy and fame is a ton of research on this is the only thing you will be happy in spite of it. If you have good perspective and you can use it for virtue and good, like you guys are doing, but it's, you'll never be happy. Like I'm actually happy because we've got, a quarter million YouTube subscribers mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. And because of the fame per se, I mean, you actually have more reach, which is really important. Okay. So what you find is that, that and those are extrinsic rewards. Intrinsic rewards are relationship focused. Okay. Intrinsic rewards family come love. from, yeah, faith, family, friends, and work where you serve. Love, 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 and more love is the bottom line. Mm -hmm. And when you take the population, so you take college people who graduate from college and you say five years from now, what do you want that would actually make you happy? Half of them will say extrinsic stuff and half of them will say intrinsic stuff. Mm -hmm. And then if you go and look at them, you'll find that the ones who are intrinsically motivated, I want to be married, for example, I want to have a good relationship with my friends. I want to have a good relationship with my family, et cetera. These are the ones who are way happier. I mean, way happier. And they have fewer physical maladies and they're less stressed out. They have fewer cases of anxiety, less clinical depression, on and on and on, less stomach aches, less anger, everything. Okay, so now I go to my students and I say, imagine yourself in five years, because based on this research, you're happy. You know what that feels like. It's, happiness is not the feeling, but you know what it feels like. You know what the turkey smells like, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Anybody's like, what's that reference? Go back to the beginning of the episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Little so, callback. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Um, so, so imagine yourself five years, you're happy. Why are you happy? They'll have done the research, my students will. But we all kind of know in our heart of hearts. Put them in order, the five reasons that you're happy in order, in order of importance. Okay, now you've got them in order. You're looking at them now. Say, come back to the present. Which one of those things are you most actively managing? It's always four and five. 
That's yeah. always four and five. I mm-hmm. love that because it even shook me up a little bit because right. I felt like I had a good grasp. Oh, these are my five. But then when I ordered them and I went, oh, wow, you know, am I really spending the most time, though, working towards mm-hmm. one and two? If I say that's one and two, I'm probably spending more time on four and five. Yeah, it's going to be your family. It's going to be your friendship. It's going to be your faith, for example, which is a classic and and goals around these things. And then and then four and five is like my career and my money. And, and those are the easiest things for you to manage because the world says manage those things and tells you how to do it. Mm-hmm. And, you, you know, if you go to the Harvard Business School, that's what they're teaching you to manage is your money mm-hmm. and your career. Mm-hmm. They're not saying, and, and except for my class, which is leadership and happiness, which is how to manage your love life, how to manage your relationships in the same way that you would think about it, in the same organized way that you would think about it in the case of your career and your money. So start getting your priorities in order is the basic. Is like, what is your, it doesn't mean you don't manage your career and your money. It's great that you're, you're, you're working hard. Fantastic. But pay as much attention to the management of your marriage and the management of your friendships and the management of your spiritual walk as you are to, you know, mind pump in the bank account. And that's what it comes down to. That's look, that's super hard for me. Yeah. Again, Mm -hmm. it brings me back. And I I, I think how um, we take that for granted because we think, oh, for work and money, I have to work every day. I have to work towards Mm -hmm. it and focus on it. Oh, love, family, stuff that just happens. Totally. But you got to put effort and work into it just the same way, right? Yeah. And there's this thing that we often do, especially men. And they'll be like, yeah, the reason I'm working so hard, honey, I'm sorry. I know you're lonely. The reason I'm working so hard is because I'm doing it for you because I love you so much. (laughs) I'm such a martyr. (laughs) Stop calling us out right now, Arthur. (laughs) (laughs) It's absolutely classic. You know, I, I interviewed a guy for the book. And he's like, yeah, my wife, ugh. you know, she doesn't get it. She doesn't get it. I mean, she, she's always complaining about the fact that I'm never home, but she wants the nice things that the money will buy. It's like, she wants those things because she's lonely. She's lonely. She wants you yeah. is the bottom line. But what you want, you don't understand yourself. You only understand a facsimile of yourself. You're mm. self-objectifying. You're homo economicus. Mm. You're the you're the you're the good one. You're the hard worker. You're the successful one. You're a success addict. So many people mm. are success addicts, and this is the they get into this cycle of managing four and five, and they get completely incompetent in one, two, and three. How do we balance that? Because obviously, there's some value in being focused in that direction, but not so focused yeah. that we. And you've said you were a success, or you identified that oh, yourself. Totally. It's my natural tendency. Yeah, my natural tendency, and part of the reason is because I distract myself from. I mean, I'm, I'm addictive, you know, I'm a success addict because I'm an addictive personality. And, and, and I, you know, and anybody who's an addict to anything, by the way, is self-medicating. Mm-hmm. This is what you find, you know, people who, who get addicted to cigarettes when they're 13, 14 years old, the other kids are like, Oh, I got a carton of cigarettes. Let's smoke these cigarettes. They're like gross. And the one kid's like actually kind of awesome yeah. and becomes a smoker early on. The aren't, reason- we, aren't we all in a sense though? I mean, isn't everybody well, somewhat- depends on what your deficit is. So yeah. the thing about the smoking case is, is illustrative. So the kid who has insufficient uh, dopamine to the prefrontal cortex has a hard time focusing Mm. and only feels focused and really effective when something artificially stimulates that and nicotinoids are the best way to do that. Mm. And so they smoke a cigarette for the first time like, oh, wow, I feel a lot better. I don't know why. And I can't even articulate it. And they're like, I want another one and another one. They get addicted by 14. Well, the same thing is true of success addicts. There's a deficit in your understanding of yourself. You know, you don't feel like a full person. You don't feel like the person that you want to be. You don't. You can't endogenously produce your happiness in in the right way. And so the result is you're looking for outside validation. You're looking for extrinsic validation of you. It's like the the outside version of Sal. And what you need to work on is the the interior version of Sal. That's and that's the way to combat it. Is number one is knowledge. Right? And when I say Sal, I mean Arthur, by the way. Mm. <laughs> it's like, who's Arthur? Uh, he's that guy that people talk about. You know, He's that guy who's got that job. He's that guy that somebody wrote that thing about, whatever it happens to be. No, 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 no. That's not, that's not the way to do it. The way to do it is to understand the problem and to do the work to actually build the person that you are. And that has to be built on love and relationships. Wow. Yeah, you're you're speaking to totally yeah, speaking to totally. Me right I mean, you guys are. I mean, you guys are successful one. and ambitious. And there's every there's tons and tons of people watching this who want to be you. But we're look, we all have the same problems. Yeah, because we're all just walking this path in the same way. Oh boy, that's challenging. Yeah. That's yeah, how I feel are. like. That's what I meant by that. Like, isn't everybody somewhere? Like I feel like everybody has something that it just manifests itself different in everybody's yeah. life. You yeah, know? for sure. So we all have different needs. We all have different. And and some people are naturally better at this than others. I mean, I know some guys who are just like they get it. 
and they get it, right? But our culture valorizes yes. the most incomplete people. Mm. Yes. You know, because you and when you meet really famous people, they're often extremely screwed up. Yeah. Oh, I always say oh, this. Yeah. What it took them to be so spectacular There's in this thing deficits elsewhere means they're most likely yeah. out of balance in, they they got of, famous for a reason yeah they did what it took to get famous it's incredibly hard work i mean i've and i've interviewed a lot of famous people for my research and they'll say get, staying famous is unbelievably hard work and extremely boring mm. huh. and it's stressful you know it's like to be a, a famous actor is 99 percent boredom and one percent terror <laughs> you know, it's like, it's a great combination of stuff that you've got to do. Right. And, but, but there's a problem that you're, that you're, that you're addressing it. Now, can you be happy and well in spite of being successful? Absolutely. That's what this book is for mm -hmm. because everybody who's reading the book or who's watching this podcast or watching this podcast, who's watching this, what are we? A show. Yeah, they do. A show yeah. Watching our show. Yeah. Watching yeah. our show. Yeah. Um, they, they want to be successful because People are people are driven this way, which is a beautiful thing about people. But don't let it ruin your happiness because it doesn't have to. How how important is the partner that we choose to do life with in this in this equation? It's critical. It's really critical. You know, people, who, especially the the most unfortunate of the people who forego love for worldly success. That is insanity. That is just as stepping over hundred dollar bills to get to nickels. Yeah. That is just nutty. And people do it all the time. It's like, I, I talk to students, you know, business school students. Like I don't have time for love. It's like, well, you don't have, you don't have time for, I mean, you can't, you can't forego this. That's like saying I don't have time to, to breathe. Or yeah. Air. Ultimately. Or you don't want to be happy. <laughs> yeah. Or you are, the, they've get, part of it is they get the formula all wrong. Yeah. They actually think that they will find lasting satisfaction in the rewards of the world. And that will substitute for the, what they really want. In other words, four and five will suddenly grow in important because they'll even do the exercise. It's like, yeah, one, two, three, yeah, but I'm still mm. going to focus on four and five. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> because four so, and five are going to become one and two. Yeah. It's just so countercultural though. Yeah. Like we're, we're just so inundated with uh, what success is. Yeah. It means how hard you work and it means yeah. like achieving this, monetary goal and, and status and fame and yeah. you know to everything you're saying is so it, it it's so different than that so yeah. how do people get into that mindset I mean obviously your book's an amazing yeah. you know piece to that puzzle but uh, I just feel like there's just not enough of that type of language out there yeah now most people have a I mean a lot of people have a really good sense of this and and do pretty well so I'm talking to strivers and you have a disproportionate striver audience. Sure. Again, people who want to be excellent will judge their own excellence based on the standards of the outside world. This is the key. Mm. Right? How do I know I'm excellent? I don't know. I'm going to look on Instagram. Yeah. I want to have right. sales apps. Right. That's excellent. Right. And they'll, they'll look at these don't standards of excellence yeah. and nobody's like, you know how to be excellent? I want to have as much love as Sal has in his marriage. Right. Because mm -hmm. that's not Instagram worthy, no. right? It's the, it's the trivial stuff by, yep. by sort of cosmic terms that we put up. And so people interpret that as the most important thing in their life. Go for it. Do the good things. Be excellent. Absolutely. You know, have success. But don't leave the most important things behind is the bottom line. Because what you're doing is you're you're not nourishing yourself in a way where anything can even give you satisfaction in the long term. Yeah, you, you talk a lot about uh, friendships and how challenging it is as you get older to make friends, especially for men. Yeah. And I've heard you talk about this and I'm like, oh, yeah. So true. Man. Oh, so true. I go to work and I go home and... I would, you know, I would be cool if I had some friends, but like I do nothing no, to like, seek it out. And if you did, you'd be cheating your family. <laughs> if you're like going away, I mean, I know you guys got this, like you, you, you guys goof off of, up in Tahoe, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because you and you guys have authentic friendship. Clearly, yeah. you have authentic friendship. But a lot of guys, if you're working in an investment bank, for example, likely as not, you would not have close friendship with the people that are on the in in the offices around you because it would be a slightly different culture. And you wouldn't cultivate, especially if you were management, you wouldn't cultivate the outside friendships because you'd be cheating your wife and kids because it's like honey yeah i'm gonna go away with the boys like no you're not yeah no you're not it's like i'm gonna golf for five hours on on saturday even though i already work 75 hours over <laughs> yeah. the week oh uh, because i'm starved for friendship well it's like so work class i mean yeah. it, it's something's got to give and what always winds up giving is love you know you take the 14th hour of work over the first hour with your friends mm -hmm. or the first hour even with your kids sometimes and that's the big mistake that people make they make bad trade-offs part of it is interesting you know i was interviewing this lady 
for the book, who's this like icon of Wall Street. I mean, she's she's just huge, really, really well known, hundreds of millions of dollars, maybe billions of dollars. She's a company founder. She's my age. And she's bummed out. I mean, she's burned out and she doesn't have good relationships. She feels like roommates with her husband and she has kind of a cordial relationship with her adult kids and ugh. And she's drinking too much and she's out of shape and she's starting to get bad blood work back from the doctor and all the stuff that happens when you're in the late fifties, you're not taking care of yourself. <clears throat> I said, she said, what should I do? It's like, you don't need a guy with a PhD to tell you this. <laughs> yeah. You know, you just told me you should probably get into AA. You should probably, um, you, you should you start walking a spiritual path. You should start going away with your husband. You should take a souvenir in your company and step back from the top management of the company. You told me what to do. Why don't you do that? She's like, thinks about it. She says, I guess I'd prefer to be special than happy. Oh, Ooh. wow. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. You know, and how many times have I talked to, I mean, I've done a lot of research on, on an addiction and I talk to people, they all know, look, if you have somebody who's addicted to drugs and alcohol, <clears throat> they know that they're not happy because mm -hmm. of their addiction, but they prefer to be high than happy. They're making that decision. And the same thing is true for success addicts is the bottom line. So you've got to know yourself and you have to take this problem on its face. You don't, you don't have to be not successful. What, what is neurologically happening there where you, they have a, a obvious awareness, yeah, but they're not choosing it, but they still yeah. choose not to what, where's the disconnect or what's going on in the brain. So what's going on in the brain is that this neuromodulator dopamine that everybody knows about now, 30 years ago, you said dopamine, nobody would know what you're talking about, but dopamine is actually not, people think about it as this, as this neurochemical of, of pleasure. It's not. It's, mm -hmm. anticip it's anticipation of reward. It basically is like, you're going to get the cookie. You're going to get the cookie. You <laughs> want the cookie, right? And what happens is your brain gets better and better and better at pumping out this dopamine, which will make you into a fiend for something that gives you the reward. Now, what's the reward? The reward is your, your crack, whatever it happens to be. And mm -hmm. everybody's got their reward. You know, some people it's gambling and some people it's sex and some people it's alcohol and some people it's success. Mm -hmm. That's the cookie. And part of it, usually these tracks are laid down neurologically when we're kids. And so if your parents are like, you're so smart, you're such a hard worker, you're so good, you're smarter than the other kids, you're always going to succeed. And the kid's like, oh, that's where I get my rewards, pat on the head hit the lever, get the success, get the promotion, get the grades, get, and they turn into these success machines where they get their dopamine. And our brains are incredibly good at, at, at becoming attuned to producing this dopamine on cue for our particular reward. Success, success addicts are really dopamine addicts. And that's how they get their dopamine is the bottom line. And you can even get away with, get away from it. This is one of the reasons that, that if you're, if you're an alcohol abuser, you could, you should probably never drink alcohol again for the rest of your life because it's like carving your initials into a tree. Mm. The tree will keep growing, but then it's like Sal loves so and so, yeah. you know. And you come back thirty years later, mortified by what you carved in the tree. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is kind of how the brain, you know, lie, lays down these dopamine tracks, the, your your ability to process dopamine. So you got to be careful with it for the rest of your life. And by the way, people who are drug and alcohol addicts have to be careful about success addiction because that's the addiction that yeah, will so. put get right into trade one for the other. So yep. what's the remedy look like? Is it a rip the bandaid off type of deal or slowly building habits and things into your life? What does that look like? It starts with knowledge. It okay. starts with knowing awareness. yourself. Yeah. yeah. Awareness is really, really critical. People underemphasize this is to is self analysis. And sometimes it's actually important as they say, talk to somebody about this because the key thing about good therapy for people who, who have, have used therapy, properly is that it's a way for you to understand yourself. It's basically going to school in where the, the subject is you. If all you're getting is just like, you know, medication and 15 minutes or something like that, that, I mean, if you need the medication, you need the medication. But the key thing for a professional, whether it's a religious professional or a counselor or a psychotherapist, whatever it happens to be, is understanding yourself better. And by the way, most of us can do that without professional intervention, but we have to do the work in understanding ourselves. Mm. Second thing is saying, I want to be happier. And most people don't do that. They don't actually say, I want to be happier. I understand what's going on and I want to be happier. You know why? Because it's admitting you're not right now. Yeah. And it's also admitting that you're willing to be less special. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I'm willing to be less special to be happy. It's like, I'm not ready for that trade yet. Mm. It's, a, you know, it's a lot of people, when you talk to people who drink way, way, way too much, they're like, yeah, I'm not happy and I'm drinking too much and screwing up my relationships and it may, might ruin my marriage and all that, but I'm not ready to stop drinking yet. And when you talk to people that, that they'll make a date to go into rehab, 
like like two months later, and they'll drink more and more and more yes. all the way up to that date. Yes, you know, right. preparing to go into rehab. Well, that's what a lot of people are doing with their uh, any addiction, actually. Wow. Well, when we talk about self awareness, we're talking about uh, emotional intelligence, right? And is this more genetic or learned behavior? What would you say? It's it's well, it's, it's a combination of both. We don't understand the genetics very well on this yet. Oh, okay. Mm. The genetics. Because I just, feel like some people are just kind of naturally oh yeah, have sure. this ability to yeah, do yeah, it and then sure. others really have to actively work at this. Yeah. And part of it is kind of the way you're brought up too. So some people are just not very brought up to be very introspective. Men tend to be worse at this than women. Mm. Men are pretty bad. Men are not introspective creatures. It's like, I feel crummy. I don't know. I thought it's going to go deadlift. Yeah. 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 Ignore like, that feeling. Yeah, pick up heavy things. <laughs> Cover it with heavy metal. Yeah, yeah. yeah kind of. Yeah, for sure. And by the way, there's a lot of people who will who who are addicted to drugs and alcohol, and then they'll become orthorexic. Yeah. And have very uh, very improper behavior in the gym. Totally. And they'll just be like working out three hours a day or something. And you know, it, which I had is, a client who did that. She quit smoking and became addicted to exercise. And I had to talk to her through the whole process. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You can get all these weird behavior. It's like, so why are you trying to dump body fat? Why are you actually, why are you doing these things? Like, I don't know. I want to feel special. Mm. I just want to feel special. Wow. Mm. What do you, can you tell us about some practices that you and, and Esther have and yeah. your family has that helps with the kind of stuff? Cause I mean, if from the outside, there's you have you travel a lot. You yeah. got you're very successful. Lots of you meet with very important people. They ask you your advice. I mean, for all intents and purposes, that sh that's an environment where a lot of stuff you're talking about could the success addict, the you know, not spending time with your family. What, what kind of practices you guys have? Well, part of it is that we're yeah. I'm I'm not always practicing what I preach. I mean, I'm on book tour right now like <laughs> yeah. six days a week or something um and 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 my wife reminded me of that yesterday she's like you know um if you read your book <laughs> subtle jab <laughs> it's, like, it's really good you should try reading it's, it. it's, it's actually a pretty effective book i mean i think it's helping a lot of people you might think you might consider it you know it's like you know i get it i get it yeah it's uh yeah. it's it, it's so so that's a problem because you know i again i wrote the book for me and I didn't even know if I was going to publish it, but Esther found my notes. So I think maybe you should write. I mean, it was, it was, it was a project for me to become happier. I was unhappy. Mm. And, and, uh, and I said, oh, I don't know if he's maybe interested in, you know, getting happier as you get older. And I don't want to write an old man book and the whole thing. <laughs> Is that really how this played out? Was it was like notes for you? And yeah. then it, oh, it wow. was my, my strategic plan for my life. Oh, I didn't know. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's so I, really and, cool. And I didn't know if it'd be popular. So I wrote it up as an article, as a feature article in the Atlantic, which is where I'm a columnist, yeah. but it was a longer 7,000 word article. And and it became one of the fifty most read essays wow. in the world. I did not know for that, that year. You know, I didn't know they kept data like this. I don't know. And it's like I guess there's a market for this. Mm -hmm. And so then I wrote it up as a book, and 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 you know people want to read the book because we're all going through the same stuff mm -hmm. in our lives. So how do we practice it? Well, in the same way that I talk about in this book, we're 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 deeply involved in our Christian faith, and as Catholics, so I go to mass every day. Which is with my wife, which is really important, and, it's, and it's, the mass is important for me. But it's also the with my wife part is really yeah. important for this because mm -hmm. we're worshiping together, we pray together every day, which really locks us into our relationship in a big way. Because look, this is a non-negotiable thing. We're she's the person I'll look at as I take my dying breath, and and this is this is the this is the relationship that actually completes me as a person critically. So I take that really super seriously and much more seriously than I did 10 years ago. And that requires practice. That requires protocols. That requires daily activities. And it doesn't happen on its own. And that's the key point that I'm making. I'm, I'm, I'm cultivating one, two, and three. Um, my relationship with my kids is super different than my relationship with my parents. I mean, I had a pretty distant relationship with my parents. And, and, you know, I moved to Europe when I was in my mid twenties to marry my wife, you know, and I was playing in an orchestra in Barcelona mm. and, you know, doing my thing as a classical musician for a long time. And I thought, I gotta get to know my parents better. I mean, my dad was a, my dad was a scientist. My mom was a, was an artist and she was creative and they were interesting people. And yeah, I really got to, I didn't get to know that. And then they died. Oh, wow. you know, they died young. My dad died at youngish. My dad died at 66. My mom was, was already cognitively impaired by my age. And so she was kind of gone. Mm. And, um, and I thought to myself, it was a real source of regret for me for a long time. And I thought, okay, okay. Regret's fine. What am I going to learn from it? Dan Pink has a new book about regret. It's a really good book. It's worth reading about how you can learn from it 
and how you can make it into a source of transcendence. How your regret is good for you. You should not tattoo no regrets on your body. <laughs> right? Oh man, especially so many people cringe here. Oh. Especially spelled wrong. Yeah. Yeah, no that's regrets. Right. <laughs> if you're going to do it, at least spell it wrong. <laughs> because that's funnier. So, and, yeah. and, uh, and, and so I, I turned it into a lesson that's actually a protocol. I mean, my kids are hither and yon. I mean, actually my oldest son, who's 23, is engaged. He's living with us right now in our guest room. So I see him all the time. Um, his brother is in the Marines at Camp Pendleton. I talk to him every day. I FaceTime with him. I try to FaceTime with him every day. Even when he doesn't want to talk to me, he's going to hear from his dad. Mm. And my little girl, she's in college in Spain. When I go back and forth, I live in Spain a lot because mm. my wife is Spanish. And, but she's in college in Spain, but we talk all the time. We've already, we've, we text, we've texted 15 times today already. And it's wow. not even lunchtime yet. And it's nine hours later there. Yeah. And, and that's because I have learned from my regret to enter into a positive um, schematic protocol that cultivates love. I'm, I'm managing love in my life in the same way that I manage my money. Anything you're learning about yourself, having a grown child, now man, living back with you. Yeah, big messy chick back in the nest. <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> that boy is messy. He does not know how to put his shoes away. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> He knows yeah, how to work changes. hard, and he's a he's a, he's a great kid. He's he's fantastic. He's mirrors back me to me, and it's funny because your kid, each one of you. How many kids do you have? I only have one. You have one, yeah. and you got three, three and a half. Yeah, yeah. You got three <laughs> and a half, yeah. and you have two, right? And they're a combination of you in a weird way, yeah. right? And True. and they they just sort of the good and the bad, and they help me understand myself a little bit better. I see the young version of me, but what I learned is that I wish that I'd had more open conversations about these things with my kids. Mm -hmm. And so I guess it's probably weird to be the child of a social scientist because, you know, my, it's like my, my little girl, she's like, they're analyzing their behavior. Yeah, if I'm everything. bothering my little girl, she's like, daddy, daddy, you're not oxygenating my ventral striatum. <laughs> <laughs> Your heart has to melt a little bit. Though, like, like, oh, she no. understands me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that just means that yeah, I'm not calm. giving her good feelings. You know? <laughs> it, but, you know, the, the key is actually... Um, um, with them is, un is seeing yourself in them and then being very, very clear about what the best life is. It's to say, you know, what's, what would, what do I want for you? And not my middle son, the Marine, he had tough, a tough time in school. He wasn't a motivated student. And I was spending all of my time haranguing him about that. And the reason is because I wanted him to have a good life. Mm -hmm. Right. But then I realized that he could interpret that as what I care about the most. Mm -hmm. I think that's a mistake. So I started saying, you know what I want for you? I want you to be honest and I want you to be compassionate and I want you to be faithful. Mm. That's what I want. Those are the three things. Everything else is gravy. I don't care if you live in my basement. I don't, I mean, I do, but <laughs> that, that wouldn't be optimal. But that's the key thing that I've actually learned from that. And I've learned as much from my kids um, as I've learned from any book that I've ever read. What about if I were to ask you if you were to look at each each child, um, because I'm sure each one was a different experience, um, what do you think that you did best with raising each individual one? Well, that's a good question. Or I know what I did worst, which is the opposite side of the same coin, right? Right, right. Um, I was trying to stay positive. Yeah, no, no, but it's actually because <laughs> you can take positive lessons from even negative. Yeah, um, I just, I love, yeah. I love talking to somebody with your experience, your wisdom um, further ahead than I am as far as fatherhood. So mm -hmm. I can be thinking about these things as I'm raising my son and potentially another one in the yeah. future. So, yeah, you know, what I did is I cultivated a lot of the most, what I think are the most, um, what I think are, are, are he really healthy interests in my first son who has a lot of the same, who loves a lot of the same things that I do. A lot of the same books, a lot of the same music that I do. Um, now, I mean, he's super nerd. He goes to opera and since he was 12 years old, he's been really into opera, That's Italian awesome. opera, right? <laughs> Cause I'm in opera. I think opera is great. I mean, it's beautiful. And, and we would go to concerts in New York city and he cultivated those particular interests, which has really, really made him a much happier person as a result of this. My second son is funny because he's, he has a lot of the same appetites that I do, but not the same interests. I mean, his main interests are blowing stuff up. He's in the Marines, you mm -hmm. know, he's a, he's a combat Marine. He's a 
you know, sniper and a mortarman in the Marine Corps. He's six foot five too, by the way. You've oh, seen, wow. yeah, you've he's seen a, a picture dude. of him. He's a, and he's, he's super, and he's Jack. He's super. Jack. Yeah. yeah. He's 200 pounds and 4.3% body fat. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. A machine. He's a machine. He's a machine. Um, <clears throat> he's not gonna be able to maintain that. <laughs> uh, that's all I can say, because let me tell you when it's 57, it's not yeah. hard. This is not easy to, 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 to stay in shape for sure. But, you know, actually figuring out what is best for him, given the fact that he's got very strong appetites and impulses. And those are the things that I share with him. Mm. And just being just completely upfront with him, mm. completely upfront with him. Carlos, you're going to want to do this. Don't do that. Don't do that. Mm. And, 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 and if he does, not freaking out. You know, here's the key thing I learned actually from my son who has my appetites. Don't freak out. That's probably the best piece of advice yeah. for fatherhood. Yeah. Don't freak out because yeah. there's nothing worth freaking out. You know, only things will only get worse and right. out, literally everything has a solution. What's done is done. And it has a solution. Every problem actually has, if they rob a bank, there's a solution to that. It's not good. Mm. You don't want that for sure, but it's never worth freaking out. And my little girl, it's just pure love. It's just pure love. I mean, I, she understands me and she just loves me and I just love her. And I'm telling her I love her all the time. Mm -hmm. And it's just this abundance of, she's, she's adopted by the way. Mm -hmm. So she's, I, as soon as I got her, I thought, man, we should have gone outside the gene pool earlier. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, yeah, she's dude. just, she's That's just perfect. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You That's know, great. you know, I have to say you're, what you're saying is, is, I mean, this is how you are in real life. I know you personally and your wife and, and you have been so gracious to, talk with Jessica and I, and, you know, I, I really look up to you and, and how you guys handle things. So just want the audience to know this, this is very authentic. This yeah. is not just a dude selling a book. Yeah. Well, and, real. and, and I've been a pump head before, um, before any of this, before you guys knew me, That's I was, wild, I was yeah. listening to the podcast and getting all kinds of knowledge about how to get happier and healthier from you guys. I mean, you guys, it's very easy to think, you know, mind pump is a fitness podcast, not a it's a happiness podcast. Mm -hmm. And and it's really the the reason that you know, I bet you that people are more interested in the first 45 minutes than the quads. That's that's actually yeah. true. I bet it's Especially true, Especially right? after they become, yeah. yeah. And the reason is because you're, you're modeling authentic friendship for each other. You're talking about things that have, they're fun, but they also have substance. And they're a model of the kind of discourse that we can and should be having more of in our society, in mm. our desiccated society where we don't have that very much of it. And that really brings a lot of happiness. And even before I knew you guys, I kind of knew you guys. Mm -hmm. And that's a beautiful thing. You're doing a good thing yeah. and I appreciate it a lot. You know, I, I, I want to, I, I know we're going a little long, but I have to ask you this because I've never met anybody as effective in this particular realm as you. You are so good at talking to people uh, who don't think the same things you do who don't, don't have the same politics, um, but they all like you and you do a good job of communicating with them. Like, what's the secret to that? And I think we need to learn a little bit of this right now because it's not happening. Everybody's so- How yeah. do you bridge that distance? Yeah, yeah. No, thank you for that. Thank you. That's It's really kind of you. Not everybody likes me. You know, it's- uh, <laughs> I don't know anybody- <laughs> well, don't they, they, But don't they Let's say if, that's, if everyone did like you, you're not doing, you're not doing the yeah, right thing, yeah, right? Yeah. And, so. and there's some people who are just so bound up in ideology sure. that it becomes a religion and sure. everything's a holy war. And yeah. so, you know, I, I, I get protested sometimes. You know, I go, to, I've been on college really? campuses. Yeah, I get, college campuses, you I get, get protested. protested. Well, part of it is just because it's That's such crazy. a highly charged <laughs> ideological environment that, yeah. you know, I'll get the chalk the sidewalk. What do they have? That's, a, that's a scary sign of the times yeah, today. Somebody that's yeah. leading with love. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, like, like, down with the love and happiness that's guy. What I'm I mean, it's, like, it's, like, it's, a good, yeah. it's a bad look for protesters. Yes, you know, it it's is. like for, for that for sure. Oh. But the whole point is that in, in an outraged culture, people are going to be outraged is the bottom mm, line. Yep. And the key thing is, is that we're, look, we're all, we're all sisters and brothers, just no exceptions. And if that's the case, treat people as such, you know, that you will never, never, persuade anybody to be better by using your values as a weapon. You can only use your values as a gift. Nobody has ever been insulted into agreement. And furthermore, mm, it's true. not fun to do that. What's really fun is to bring love, even when love is not, you're not getting love. You know, this is what warms your heart. I've had these experiences where I inadvertently answer hatred with love and I feel it changes my heart. Sometimes it changes their heart too, under the circumstances, but I've just gotten better at it. You know, I've had missionaries on both sides of my family. 
And, and <laughs> you know, missionaries are constantly getting rejected. Yeah. They're kind of, it's like, nobody's ever said, Hey, great news. There's missionaries on the porch. Ever, <laughs> there's right? guys on bikes. Come it's on like, in. Oh no. <laughs> it's like, pretend we're not home. You know, <laughs> <That's true. laughs> but they're full of happiness. And, and the reason is because they're sharing something with love that they think is critically important. Even if some people are not going to take it. And that's what we can have. You guys are missionaries. Mm. You're missionaries for something that's good and healthy and happy and nutritious for everybody. I mean, morally nutritious for everybody and taking that out with the spirit of the missionary so that nobody is ever turned off to it. You know, nobody is ever you, where, where you as the vehicle for it are not uh, alienating to people who are listening. That's such a beautiful opportunity is the key thing. And the more I do it, the more you do that, the more you want it is the yeah. bottom line. So the, the secret is simple, love everybody mm. and treat everybody like your sister or brother. And, and, and then go from there. And sometimes it doesn't turn out so great, but or nearly it does. Well, you're, you're a passionate person. It's not like you're, you're just naturally like, I mean, you're a pat, you have, you have opinions, you're very passionate, but you have to practice this. I see. That's what I, I fall prey to. I'm a very passionate person. I get very excited. And then afterwards I go, Oh man, I, I we had the best feet on Instagram. Yeah, absolutely. Well, well like, you know, I used to. You know, they booted used me, right? I know, I know, I do. Yeah. Of course, I know that. I noticed that the first day. I was like, I texted you, just like, Sal, are you not on Instagram? Where are because you? Because you're the reason I opened up that app. Because uh, it was, I would openly laugh. The more childish your jokes, the more I laughed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Someone didn't like it. They kicked me off. So I'm on Twitter now, but I'm a little bit yeah. more aggressive there. I need to, after talking to you, though, yeah. I really, I, it's, always, it's always such a pleasure having you. Oh, I love such your a show. Pleasure. I yeah. love what you guys are doing. Yeah. What a privilege for me to be yeah. part of this in some small way. Um, and I yeah. got to say, if we, you we need more of you out if there, if you man. got time, like find Arthur Brooks on YouTube, read his books. Like they're they're very effective and positive, and they make you feel good. And so, if you want to be a better person, like I can't recommend, I can't recommend all, all your stuff enough. Like all of it makes you feel good, and it's all very actionable. You, you're very good at communicating. Here's the steps that you can take. So I appreciate that, and I, I hope all our listeners take my advice there. Thanks, guys. Appreciate Thanks. it. Thanks Love being with you. Thanks again. Awesome.